Welcome to the Three Martini Lunch. Grab a stool next to Greg Corumbus of Radio America and Jim Garrity of National Review. Three Martinis coming up. We are glad you're here for the Wednesday edition of the Three Martini Lunch. We've saved your stool right over there. We have good, bad, and crazy martinis. And in a return to normalcy, Jim, two of our three martinis really don't have much to do about coronavirus. They're about the 2020 presidential campaign. And let's start with a good martini. Our next president is not going to be an avowed socialist. So we can just pause and exhale and be grateful for that. Yeah. Bernie Sanders Emphasis today. on avowed. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Bernie Sanders officially uh, suspending his campaign today. He's going to talk to his supporters later. Uh, that obviously leaves Joe Biden as the presumptive Democratic nominee, which we've known for weeks anyway. Uh, it's odd that he did this the day after the Wisconsin primary, and we don't have results. It almost reminds me, Jim, of that moment from The Wedding Singer, where uh, Adam Sandler finds out that his fiance uh, didn't want to marry him and been cheating on him. And he says, you know, this is information that could have been brought to our attention yesterday. But uh, anyway, Bernie Sanders got off to a great start. But instead of uh, unifying the party, he decided to embrace Castro. And here we are. Bernie Sanders won't be president of the United States. That's good news. Yeah, there, there is a little bit of an element of General Francisco Franco is still dead to today's <laughs> news. Um, much like an M. Night Shyamalan character, the Bernie Sanders campaign has been dead all along, or at least dead since uh, South Carolina. You're going to see a lot of obituaries for the Sanders campaign in the coming weeks. Many of them were written weeks and weeks ago. Um, it, it's interesting because there was a point after those first couple primaries where it looked like, wow, it was really going to happen. Bernie Sanders had figured out a way that he had, that, that for all of his flaws, his age, his uh, barking similarity to, to Larry David and all that kind of stuff, that he had tapped into something that a chunk of the Democratic Party base had wanted. Not the entire chunk, certainly not numbers in African Americans weren't terrific, but there was a chunk of the uh, progress, hard left progressive, uh, you know, older white voters did want this. And a good chunk of the younger voters wanted this. And that this was good, that was going to be enough to win the nomination. And those of us who, you know, I, I don't have that much of a rooting interest in the Democratic primary, but to me, the sooner you beat the socialists, the better. I know there were some folks like, well, because uh, Trump will have a better chance of beating Bernie Sanders. And by the way, I think that was the case. I think Sanders would have had a very difficult time winning the state of Florida. I think uh, Bernie Sanders would have had a very difficult time winning the state of Pennsylvania with his proposed fracking ban. Um, they're like, well, you know, good conservatives and good Republicans should be rooting for Bernie Sanders. I'm like, no, no, <laughs> I can't do that. Uh, I like seeing socialists lose any day of the week and twice on Sundays. But the thing about Sanders was is that he had those big th first three victories. And that was at the point where all of a sudden you go from being the insurgent, you go from being the challenger to being the front runner. And your role then is then to start expanding your support, right? That's when you usually want to uh, reach out to some of those candidates who either have dropped out or who are, are you know, clearly not going anywhere. Um, you kind of want to maybe extend an olive branch or two to the rest of the party. This is not the time to say, I'm going to rub our noses of our foes in, in the dirt. And uh, this is a conquest of the rest of the party. And, you know, this is, your, your pitch to the, your fellow members of your party should not resemble that of the Borg. Uh, lower your shields and your, your, you will be at, your, your, your culture will be added to our own resistance is futile. Very rarely in politics do you end up with a, um, in a position where you have such an overwhelming mandate that you can force others, uh, that you can make them knuckle under the way you want to do things. You know, there was a hubris to the Sanders campaign, and it could not adjust. And ultimately, I mean, the first thing was a glaring jump, you know, uh, kind of, you know, flickering red light on the dashboard for the uh, Sanders campaign was how much he was percentage wise not doing as well as he did four years ago against Hillary Clinton. Uh, he was getting about half in a whole bunch of those states. He was getting, you know, a smaller percentage this time around. Yes, it was a huge field this time and only basically a one on one race against Hillary Clinton from the beginning last time around. But that indicated that a chunk of his support last time around was simply the, the, the appeal of Bernie Sanders of being not Hillary Clinton. He didn't have that status anymore. And now with this much bigger buffet table of options, eh, about a you know, quarter to a third of Democrats were picking him. That, that, against in a 10-candidate field, that's terrific. In a two-candidate field, that's not so terrific. And that's what happened. And he could not, uh, you know, it, again, I can understand why Sanders supporters feel blindsided by this. We did not think that uh, Pete Buttigieg was going to you know, drop out when he did, 
that Amy Klobuchar was going to drop out when she did, that basically the sheer speed with which the rest of the party consolidated around Bernie Sa- around Joe Biden right before Super Tuesday, you know, that's pretty much unprecedented. Certainly Republicans could not do that when there was, you know, an effort against Donald Trump in 2016. However, I think that says something about how much Bernie Sanders freaked out the rest of the Democratic Party. One, because they thought they weren't so sure that he could defeat Donald Trump. But two, I think it's safe to say there's a bunch of centrist Democrats who just aren't interested in the idea of becoming a socialist party. It's not merely, oh, we don't think this gets us a win in in November. They also don't necessarily want to live in Bernie Sanders' uh, vision of America. And that also, like, that's not a... um, you know, once Americans find out that they don't get to keep their health insurance that they have if they happen to like it, and that they have to go through Medicare for all because Medicare for all turns out to actually be for all, like it says right there in the title, um, the whole bunch of, you know, the nice suburban soccer moms and, and the folks, the union members, like, well, wait a second, wait a second. I don't know if we want this. We, we, we worked hard to get these, uh, the health insurance that we have. We don't know if we have faith in a government system to be better than what we have right now. This frightened us. Bernie Sanders and his team never really could adjust and adapt to those sorts of things. So this is where he is. You know, two cycles in a row, the strong second place finisher. He definitely speaks for a chunk of the party. Um, but I also would point out, and I think you saw that last debate in the studio up in CNN. He was not a man who could adjust his message uh, to the, uh, the moment as the coronavirus crisis became clearer and more severe, including spending some time defending the Chinese government, which is really not a good idea right now. So uh, technically, the general election has now you know, more or less begun. But I think it's safe to say that just, you know, until we have this uh, coronavirus situation under more control, the minds of most Americans won't really be on the presidential election for a while. Jim, one of my favorite things that I'm already seeing today is uh, in such great contrast to where we were just about six weeks ago, because I'm sure you, like me, between Nevada and South Carolina, you had dedicated establishment Democrats coming up to you with a look on their face like, there's a murder in my house and I have to call the cops kind of a thing. Uh, We have to stop this guy. This is imperative. I mean, they were freaking out. And now today, because they don't want to lose Sanders voters in November, are like, you know, Bernie did a great service to the party. He really (laughs) spoke for a a clear section of this party that hadn't been heard in a while. And he's a valuable contribution. You're hearing Biden saying Bernie's got to be part of this movement and so forth. And maybe Sanders will go uh, easier on him just because he likes him more than he liked Hillary. But uh, the the 180 uh, from the Democratic establishment now that Bernie's out is just very entertaining to watch. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that's kind of an interesting dynamic to watch when you see a popular movement get started Um, I think it's safe to say that when Donald Trump says A, his supporters say A. When he says B, they say B. There isn't a huge gap between what Trump thinks and what the average Trump voter thinks. I'm not so sure it's the case between Bernie Sanders and Bernie Sanders supporters. Um, You already saw, you know, studies that have indicated a sufficient number of Bernie Sanders voters, not a lot, but probably in the neighborhood of 10%, 12%, 15% voted for Donald Trump in the general election in 2016. Bernie Sanders did not support Donald Trump in 2016. They may have some similar areas in populism and trade limits and stuff like that, but Sanders endorsed Hillary Clinton. It may have been kind of begrudging. It may have been kind of half-hearted, but it was there. Bernie Sanders supporters are not, did not salute and say, yes, sir, we're going to go vote for Hillary Clinton because you told us to. I don't know. Yes, you're, you're accurate. that the, Joe Biden and Bernie Sanders, having both been around Washington for a long time, appear to have at least a good personal relationship, despite the disagreements they have on policy. But I don't know if Bernie Sanders supporters are really itching to vote for Joe Biden. I think Joe Biden to them represents the status quo, represents the establishment, represents the way the Democratic Party has operated for, the, for a generation. And they're just not interested in that. And it's going to be really interesting to see how these few folks uh, feel about things in the next couple of months and heading into November. You know, it's interesting the way Biden's been handling this coronavirus crisis. You'd think with all of his problems in public speaking, he would just take the opportunity to hunker down since he's not getting a ton of attention anyway. But instead, he's out there all the time and, you know, telling us what he did in the pandemic of 1977. And uh, and just it's just making every conventional piece of wisdom about Joe Biden true every single day. He's not helping himself, which is probably another good martini. Greg, am I cynical to think that every day's, you know, video conference with Joe Biden is basically uh, amounts to proof of life? <laughs> that look, you know, we, we, as I you know, wrote in the corner today, like, first of all, almost everybody at the upper levels of the United States government right now is at least 70 years old, except for Mike Pence and Kevin McCarthy. 
the Republicans are the young ones. Um, Pelosi, Hoyer is 81, by the way. I had no idea. I had no really? idea. Steny Hoyer looks fantastic for 81. That's good for 81, but 81. That having been said, he's, you know, he's really up there. Pelosi just turned 80. You know, we're dealing with a virus that is particularly dangerous to elderly Americans. This is not <laughs> the leadership crop you'd probably want to head into in that situation. And I think if Joe Biden, like, didn't do any televised appearances for three or four days, you'd start hearing people getting very nervous about that. Uh, I assume by staying at home in Delaware, he's probably minimizing his exposure to new people and stuff like that. But, uh, you know, I think, I think people are worried about elderly Americans and Joe Biden, as well as Bernie Sanders, as well as Donald Trump, and as well as a whole bunch of our uh, office holders are elderly Americans. And uh, so you want to hear from them regularly just to, just to make sure they're doing okay. Ah, uh, so praising Castro is still a political loser. I'll, I'll take that in 2020. Uh, yes. Good yeah. news <laughs> is scarce. I will take it. I will take it. All right, let's move on to our bad martini now, Jim. And this is bad in a number of sense, uh, because first of all, you've got a lot of folks nervous right now about their freedoms. And a lot of folks would say, well, in this particular circumstance for a little bit of time to help get this under control, we'll make this sacrifice. Others are worried that uh, once governors and other officials have done this, it'll be easier for them to do it for other reasons and less severe reasons down the road and so forth. But uh, now we've got uh, another issue when it comes to our privacy, and that is with our healthcare information. This is Politico reporting now. White House Senior Advisor Jared Kushner's task force has reached out to a range of health technology companies about creating a national coronavirus surveillance system to give the government a near real-time view of where patients are seeking treatment and for what and whether hospitals can accommodate them according to four people with knowledge of the discussions. The proposed national network could help determine which areas of the country can safely relax social distancing rules and which should remain vigilant, but it would also represent a significant expansion of government use of individual patient data, forcing a new reckoning over privacy limits amid a national crisis. They quote a woman named Jessica Rich here from the Federal Trade Commission's Consumer Protection Bureau. She says, this is a genuine crisis. We have to work through it and do our best to protect people's health. But doing that doesn't mean we have to destroy privacy. So, Jim, I think you and I instinctively would kind of like the idea of, you know what, things are looking pretty good in this part of the country here and over here. We can probably ease the restrictions. Other areas not looking so good. We should keep them in place for a little while. But uh, at what risk to our own private data? Yeah. So early on in this crisis, you started seeing arguments of, boy, we're doing a terrible job here in America. Why can't we do a better job like the uh, countries in Asia are doing? Now, obviously, some of the options, you know, let, I'm going to take China out of the equation because they lie all the time and they were welding doors shut to prevent people from uh, leaving their homes. But people were looking at places like Singapore, places like Hong Kong, Taiwan, and probably Japan and South Korea in that group of countries. They're like, wow, they really seem to be doing a better job of reducing the spread. Why can't we be more like them? And there are a bunch of different reasons for this. One of them being um, there's a pre-existing predisposition to uh, wearing masks uh, when you're sick in, in these countries. Smaller countries, smaller populations, more densely packed, probably a little bit easier to track people's movements and things like that. But the one fact that all of them had in common that I laid out in a morning jolt a couple of weeks ago and that I think most Americans would not be comfortable with is that one you, once you tested positive, you had to download something to your phone. And basically, they were tracking your movements through your phone. And basically, you, you were told to go home, walk to the four corners of your home so that they can get a, a calibrate the you know, quarantine area you're allowed to be in. And they basically, they were tracking you. And also they were using credit card statements. They were also using uh, closed circuit, you know, security camera footage. They were basically using every uh, tool in the book to make sure they were tracking all of your movements and that you were honoring your quarantine stuff. Uh, and I don't know if Americans would be okay with that. I think they probably would say, wait a minute, we want to stop this virus too. We want to stop the spread. But now we're, the government's getting into something a little too Orwellian for our taste. And it's worth noting, They've had drones flying around New York City that apparently have some sort of voice telling people you are too close to each other, spread out, you know, or practice social distancing and things like that. That's a more than a little bit creepy. And I, something that clearly was meant well over in the United Kingdom, some town's police force for some reason has a Dalek. For those who don't watch Doctor Who, these are these, you know, race of evil robots that are, you know, 
kind of like giant metallic lumps with, you know, little cannons sticking out that roll around and keep saying things like exterminate, exterminate, and stuff like that. And so they had this Dalek, and it was a remote control sort of thing or what, going around the town telling people, stay in your quarantine, stay in stores, stay, you know, all this kind of stuff. And it was kind of funny, kind of not, <laughs> because the Daleks are evil. And oh, by the way, they started out as a metaphor for Nazi Germany and representing this, you know, malevolent force that cannot be negotiated with and stuff like that. It would be as if American police started getting Terminator skeletons marching around the streets of your community to say, stay indoors, humans, Skynet commands it, you know. I know that the authorities are trying to get their, their arms around this and are trying to look at every possible option to prevent the spread. But there are certain steps that we as a country built on individual liberties are just not going to be comfortable with. And I think giving too much of our health data uh, easily accessible to both governments and the police is going to be ranking high up there. Now, on the other hand, they need to have this data. They need to know who's infected, who's not. And probably... From information like that, they'd also like to know stuff like your age. Uh, do you have high blood pressure? Do you have, are you recovering from cancer? Do you have diabetes? All these other factors that can complicate. Are you a smoker? You know, uh, all kinds of information that probably could make you at greater risk of succumbing to the coronavirus. So you lay all this out. I recognize, like what makes this a bad martini? I don't think there's a, a good or easy answer to this probably good quarantining and good effective health policy requires citizens to give up a certain amount of their privacy. The problem is from everything from the, the you know, research of what the NSA was doing, we have seen too much data in the hands of government inevitably gets abused. This is how, you know, there's that study of NSA people who were checking up on their ex-girlfriends and stuff like that. Um, I know the argument would be, oh, this would be a temporary measure for the coronavirus. But once the government has this data, uh, of health, you know, tracking people and, and access to their phones and, you know, their health status and things like that. I think we, we really run the, the, the risk of setting up something that we will regret down the road. You know, no easy choices here, but I think I, at the very least, we just hope the administration treads carefully recognizing that this is the sort of thing where, you know, under any other circumstances, we'd be screaming bloody murder about the government collecting this much data on us and tracking our movements. Absolutely. So even in a situation like this, you've got to be asking tough questions because the government natural bent is towards power, uh, regardless of who's in charge, because once you exercise, it becomes, like I said, easier the next time. And you have the French now, Jim, uh, suggesting that they're going to uh, ban outdoor exercising. So I'm sure that is going to go over well. They say at least at certain times they need to thin it out because too many people are exercising at the same times of day. So they're not spread apart enough. And so they're going to be cracking down on people being outside. That'll go over well long term, I'm sure. You know, Greg, I was going to say after um, the experience we had, I had this weekend over at Manassas, I understand why they got to do this. Uh, you know, there is this frustration when you see people and they're ignoring it. I'm sure everybody felt the same way um, when they saw the footage of those, those uh, college kids over in, in Florida and stuff like that. I thought France had been handling this really well. I understand as they were telling the public that you have to remain at least two baguettes apart. Um, <laughs> each one of them is about three feet long. So just picture two baguettes between you. And they're even saying French men had to, you know, stay away from their mistresses um, wow. during this time period. That's how severe this is. But, uh, you know, I, if I could work in a mime joke, I would. <laughs> keep, them in the, keep them in the box. <laughs> there you go. There's probably a joke in there about how they usually strike for several weeks at a time, multiple times a year. So there really doesn't feel that much different to them. But uh, yeah. we are all hoping the coronavirus <laughs> takes August off. That would be nice. We love you. Well, we I, love France. Of course we, we do. do it's love a great France. country. I've been know. to France. It's a beautiful place. We so. mock them because like we mock them like we love, mock our siblings. All right, Jim, back to the presidential campaign trail, though I have to admit that when I saw this news, my initial reaction was, what's he running for? Uh, because I remembered later that he got in, but it's easy to forget. Lincoln Chafee, to the sad, sad realization of at least a couple people in this country, is no longer a Libertarian Party presidential candidate. You might remember Lincoln Chafee uh, was a Republican U.S. senator, succeeded his late father in the Senate, lost to the uh, brainiac wizard Sheldon Whitehouse in 2006. Uh, he then became an independent governor of Rhode Island, then ran for president in 2016, very briefly, as a Democrat. You might remember his one-and-done debate performance. And now he's a libertarian, decided to run for president. But alas, the coronavirus and the fact that nobody wants him to be president have combined for him to end this campaign. His tweet says, as a new libertarian, 
I entered their, their, not our, their presidential nomination race. But being new to the party, 2020 just isn't the year for me to top the ticket. I'll continue to advocate for peace, deficit reduction, and the Libertarian Party. Thank you to all of my supporters. And I think it's pretty bold that he made that plural, Jim, in terms of supporters. So yes. <laughs> uh, what do you make of Lincoln Chafee whiffing yet again? When I see him thanking his supporters, I really want to ask, name them. <laughs> so first of all, this was a failed campaign by any metric. <laughs> um, and and you know, I, I will make one observation because I, I complain about no hope candidates jumping in and being taken seriously by a media that really should know better, not just in the sense of, um, I don't want to say you're wasting the time of your audience, but you know, like, look, we all could kind of tell uh, things were not looking very good for Jay Inslee, right? And yet it's, everybody had to write their Jay Inslee profile piece, you know? Um, but I think even more than that, that look, why do candidates who have no chance of being president run? Because they think they can, you know, raise their profile uh, for something else. And we saw probably, you know, ironically, John Hickenlooper out in Colorado run for president for a while, get nowhere, and then he jumped into the Senate race. Um, I don't think presidential campaigns should turn into, hey, here's how you can become a celebrity. And this is a drum I've been beating on for a long time, and listeners to the podcast recognize this. I think I can't complain about the coverage of Lincoln Chafee, in part because most people didn't know Lincoln Chafee was running for president. Most people didn't know that he was running as a libertarian. Most people barely remember him. And if they do remember him, it's entirely because of the metric system uh, argument he had put forth there. But one of the things I think that, like, maybe he's maybe the best example of this. I, I used to, you know, joke about, you know, my, my colleague, Charlie Cook, watching Jim Gilmore insist after getting 11 votes in Iowa that he was going to win the New Hampshire primary. And Charlie, in his utterly dignified voice, saying, there is something terribly wrong with this man. Um, and just having this sense that, like, you know, like if you, if, if Greg, if you announced you were running for president and you got 11 votes in Iowa, and you kept running around insisting you were going to win New Hampshire, I would try to sit you down and say, Greg, it's not happening. Stop it. And, and I'm not saying these people need to be like, committed to mental institutions, but I just say, like, you look at this, you're like, where are the friends of George Pataki? Where are the friends of... Um, I'm trying to think of other... Swalwell? <laughs> yeah, right. Who would just say, look, buddy, buddy, I know you're excited by this. I know you, you're, you're envisioning everybody chanting your name, but... It's not happening. You look silly. You're wasting everybody's time. Just, just focus on being a good congressman. Focus on being, be, there are lots of other things you can do to help this country other than run to, to be in charge of it. And, I, you know, Lincoln Chafee really needed somebody like that in his life to say, no, <laughs> you're, first of all, you're not a libertarian, right? That's, that'll be the first glaring, you know, clue is that you really should have some sort of connection to the party. It, there's a really uh, troubling subtext of, Will you be my friend to his closing statement? Am I, am I wrong, Greg? I think so. And so he, when, you know, Charlie Chris jumps from party to party, you know, this idea of folks who just clearly want to run for something. And it's almost, it, I almost wonder if this is addictive. It's not quite cocaine. It's not quite heroin or, or alcohol or something. But I'm clearly has got to be some sort of endorphin rush that comes from being treated as if you're a serious presidential candidate. And I feel like the dealers in the form of the media, really need to be more responsible. This is, in a very strange way, having a, having a glowing profile written about you. Of course, it makes you feel good. Maybe it's like, you know, opioids. Maybe it gives you this little rush. It makes you feel really good. And if we're really angry at pharmacies that pop out these things without being careful and asking whether the person really needs this or not, maybe we can be critical of other, like, look, if you write too many glowing profiles, do you realize what happens, Greg? You turn into Beta O'Rourke. <laughs> we don't want that happening to more people. No. And Lincoln Chafee uh, didn't realize, I think, Jim, and uh, obviously this could change over time, but the Libertarian Party had its moment in 2016 when the negatives were sky high on Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. People paid attention to the Libertarian Party in numbers that probably have never happened before. And they nominated a guy who held his tongue while he was talking in national TV interviews and William Weld, who is not a Libertarian, as evidenced by the fact he ran for president this time in a different party. So uh, that, was their, that was their best shot, and they fumbled the ball badly, and I don't think they're getting it back anytime soon. Yeah, um, I'll, I, have, I haven't checked on this, but a couple of weeks ago, one of my regular uh, National Review readers and friends of the, of the institution who really keeps an eye on libertarian things pointed out, as of two weeks ago, the Libertarian Party's convention was scheduled to go ahead in like mid-May. I really hope they're going to reschedule that. I don't think we're going to be out of the, out of the woods on this uh, thing until then. But uh, we will see. 
we 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 oh, but like that just I saw that I was just like Ugh. guys that seemed might be a little bit early but you know good luck getting libertarians to listen to what the government is saying. On that note, Jim, very good. We will uh, see you tomorrow. Hopefully, we've got some more good news. See you, see you tomorrow, Greg. Jim Garrity, National Review. I'm Greg Columbus, Radio America. Thanks so much for being with us today. Uh, don't forget to subscribe to the podcast. Leave us a kind review with five stars, please. Also, you can get us on those home devices. All you have to say is play Three Martini Lunch podcast. And join us Thursday for the next Three Martini Lunch. <laughs>